Note, the following has been dramatized from real events in order to protect the identities of real partisans, heroes working behind the enemy lines to free their country. The knife plunged deep, straight into the base of the neck. I'd been a hunter before the war started. I knew that the best way to deliver a merciful kill to a wounded animal was to sever the spine just below the head. But this wasn't a mercy kill. I just didn't want the drunk Russian screaming for help. I'd killed before, but never directly. The information I passed along let others pull the trigger. I must have been responsible for dozens of deaths, but never personally. The man's hot blood splashed on my face and steamed in the air, but he only let loose a low gurgling noise as he fell to the ground, dragging me down with him. One. Six weeks earlier. Traitor! Sympathizer! The two older women pelted me with their handbags, beating me as I tried to rush away from them and down the sidewalk. Russian dog! They repeated their insults as they chased after me. I stumbled on a piece of ice and fell to the floor. The women continued to mercilessly smack me with their handbags. You there, stop immediately! A Russian patrol had come up to a stop and two soldiers stepped out brandishing their weapons. The old women looked at them with menace in their eyes. One spat on the ground next to me. Worthless dog! Before they both turned away. The Russians began to laugh as I picked myself up off the icy sidewalk. Fearsome women, you best watch where you walk from now on. I searched around on the ground for the broken cigarette I had been lighting before being attacked, then cursed when I found it split in half. Cigarettes were getting expensive with the war raging. The Russians had promised the economy would be, in their words, revitalized and strengthened. But after months of occupation, their promises had failed to materialize. I finished the pack of cigarettes out of my pocket and pulled one out, offering it to one of the soldiers. Here, for my saviors. The men laughed as I fished out a second one and offered it to the other soldier, then plucked one out for myself. You have a problem with the babushkas? Yet, they have a problem with me. I helped one of your boys. Vehicle got stuck. Pulled them out of the snowbank. They didn't like that. Not many people around here do. The older soldier, perhaps only by a year or two, but clearly in charge, nodded. Aye, potty. Fool. Colonel chewed him out for a broken fender. We chatted as the cigarettes burned down to a stub. The men were cautious but seemed relaxed enough. When they realized I wasn't going to try to shoot them or toss a grenade and run, they had gotten more cautious since they first rolled into the city, expecting to be greeted as liberators. Local insurgents had made them pay for their foolishness. Now everywhere the Russians went in the city, they went heavily armed and in minimum of twos, help only a few minutes away via radio. These two seemed glad for the friendly conversation, something they no doubt rarely got from the occupied population. There were some collaborators, but the insurgency had been brutal about just cutting them down and punishing them. Now people were afraid of both Russians and being caught having a polite conversation with them for fears of being labeled as a collaborator. After a few minutes though, the men wished me a good morning and loaded back into their vehicle. I turned on my heel and went back to my apartment. My two elderly neighbors greeted me inside the arched entranceway a few minutes later. Risky, you know there's rumors they shot women, old and young, north of Kiev. Katerina was about 80, reminded me of my own grandmother, but full of fire. There wasn't a trace of fear in her voice. I know, grandmother. I would have stopped them if they tried. Katerina nodded solemnly, then checked the buttons on my coat in her typical grandmotherly way. She'd become a surrogate in the months since my own family had been killed by a Russian missile. You do good work. I'm very proud of you, but you be careful. This is dangerous and not just because of the Russians. She was right. Later that day, as I watched the streets below me with binoculars and made note of the comings and goings of the Russian patrols, I reflected on her warning. My plan was simple, gain the confidence of the Russians, get them to spill valuable intelligence, forward it to my handler via a secure messaging app. The women had been a ruse, all to gain the confidence of the two young soldiers. Word would soon spread that there was at least one Ukrainian friendly to the orcs, to both sides, and there was no way I could protect myself from attack by another member of the resistance. We were a network of independent operators, working in cells of two to five at a time. There was no chain of command, no structure. It made it impossible to wipe us out when one of us got caught, but it made it risky to run such complicated ruses on the Russians. I had made peace at meeting my end at the end of a Russian rifle, but it would be most unfortunate to be killed by your own team. The distant sound of artillery seemed to grow in intensity. 2. The sound of artillery in the distance had begun to grow in intensity over the last few weeks, like a slowly rising crescendo. The artillery grew more and more frequent. Supply trucks had started regular convoys toward the sounds of the fighting twice a week. It was difficult to get news from the outside world. The Russians did all they could to control the internet, something they were pretty good at. They'd cut off all Ukrainian and European television broadcasts into the occupied regions, replacing them with Russian television which was full of propaganda. The Russians made it a point to remind us daily that Ukraine had abandoned us. 
Kyiv either had fallen or was on the verge of collapse. Many had believed the propaganda until the sound of distant artillery had reached the city. Like every other partisan in the city, I used encrypted messaging apps to communicate with others I cooperated with and with a handler outside of the city. Viber was the most popular app. Most had stopped using Telegram thanks to its Russian roots. There'd been no word of it being compromised, but with the horror stories coming out of the detention centers that Russia had set up, nobody was taking any chances. Sometimes we even used Facebook Messenger via dummy accounts. This gave me a line to the outside world that most people didn't have, and it's how I knew the sounds of distant fighting was the Ukrainian army drawing closer. The thought of being liberated invigorated me, drove me to taking new, bigger risks than I should have. My handler was a member of the Ukrainian security services, simply named Joe. Joe had been trained by the Americans after the annexation of Crimea, and passed that training along as best he could via messaging app. Mostly though, we talked about troop movements, current events, rumors. I fed Joe a steady diet of every stray piece of information I thought would be useful. Now he needed me to get one more piece of useful info, a simple visual confirmation of a concentration of Russian vehicles in a warehouse in the center of town. I figured he'd want to count, as to ascertain the exact number and estimate troop strength for the attacking forces, but he'd insisted he only needed a visual confirmation the vehicles were there. The warehouse in question had been converted to military use. It had a massive indoor garage for truck repair that had been converted into vehicle storage for Russian infantry carriers, with the rest spilling out into a large yard with overhead cover via a huge sheet metal awning. I figured the Russians probably kept the vehicles hidden from overhead drones or American spy satellites best they could. The Russians loved to complain about the American eye in the sky and blamed Americans for every major setback or military disaster. But it was my people pulling the trigger on the front line, not the Americans. I was relieved Joe only wanted confirmation of the vehicles. There were so many I feared taking the time to count them would have taken too long. The Russians were only half aware, drunk most of the time, but you never wanted to loiter around an area for too long. They'd been known to snatch people off the streets just for hanging around too long for their liking. Their paranoia was only increasing as the occupation turned bloodier and bloodier. I returned to my apartment and sent the message, a simple confirmation followed by an estimated count. The response was a simple thumbs up emoji, then a fireworks emoji. Three hours later, and a series of explosions rocked the city from the direction of the warehouse. Secondary explosions followed as the fuel inside dozens of vehicles parked in close proximity to each other exploded. The fire roared out of control as firefighters battled it all night. In the morning, the area had been cordoned off. You couldn't get within blocks of it, and the scowling Russian soldiers were there to stop anyone who tried. From the looks on their faces, they were ready to shoot, not arrest anyone who loitered or seemed a little too curious. I climbed a tall residential building and broke the lock on the door to the roof. From there, I could look at the ruined warehouse through binoculars. The carnage was impressive. It couldn't have been artillery, the fighting sounded way too far away, and it wasn't sabotage otherwise Joe would have been in contact with a completely different team planting the bombs, he'd have no need of me. This was something new, precise, very long range, had to be something American, for all their faults, they were very good about blowing things up from far away with great precision. 3. My time being kind to the Russian soldiers had paid off. Every day I made it a point to go out for a morning cigarette and stand at exactly the same place. At first, I'd wave down the two Russians who had helped me fend off the staged attack, after which I'd quickly offer them a cigarette. Soon word had spread that there was a friendly Ukrainian always willing to offer a cigarette along that patrol route. I started bringing small nips of vodka or rum with me to share as well. That quickly made me very popular. The rest of the neighborhood began to despise me. Some of it was feigned, a big act to help sell my cover. Some of it, however, was genuine and I couldn't dispel it. I couldn't run the risk of outing myself or of those who were helping me sell the ruse. The thought of a Ukrainian knife in my back terrified me, but the risk was worth it. The soldiers had very loose tongues. These tongues became even looser when I invited them to my friend's bar for drinks after their shift. I promised them pretty girls, and nobody would spit on their drinks there. They laughed. But whether it was stupidity, or the promise of pretty girls, or the loneliness of conscripted youth sent to occupy a foreign land with few friends, the men came. Elena served drinks with generous portions. She made a big show of welcoming the Russians, saying that she'd been ripped off several times by Ukrainian gangs taking advantage of the lax law enforcement. She welcomed the occupiers as long as they promised to keep her bar safe. The men readily swore oaths to protect Elena and her bar. It wasn't difficult to see why. She was young, heavier set, but carried it very well. Her beaming smile could thaw solid ice, and her long blonde hair was translucent even in the low bar light. She was a beautiful woman, and a vivacious one at that but she was also a patriot and in the business of killing Russians. 
Not directly, but indirectly. She plied them with alcohol and flirtatious looks, offered them a friendly place with good food and a good drink to unwind from the horrors of the war. These were mostly young boys, most no older than 22. For all their bravado, they were scared inside. The city must have seemed like a terrifying place to them, the buildings high above them on all sides, a sniper potentially lurking behind every window, every alley possibly hiding a gang of Ukrainian men armed with rifles, waiting to fire on a passing patrol. Sometimes they did. Olena played to their longing for safety and companionship. Understanding how our enemy felt sometimes made it hard to do our job. These were mostly just boys handed a gun and put in uniform, but these boys and the army they represented had tortured, killed, and abused Ukrainians all over the country, especially the women. This was not something Olena was blind to. She played a dangerous game. At any moment, a drunk soldier could simply demand she leave with him at gunpoint, but she played the soldiers expertly, flirting just enough with each that the boys grew jealous and antagonistic to each other. If anyone tried anything, the rest would put him in his place. She was a natural Matahari. Maybe history would remember her this way if we were successful. The soldiers spilled their secrets in frustrated outbursts. The older men, especially the officers and the few NCOs the Russians had, were better at watching their mouths, but I'd never met a Russian who didn't love boasting and whose mouth didn't run like a river after plying it with enough alcohol. One day, shortly after the bombing on the vehicles, two senior officers, a major and a colonel, walked in. Prostitutes hung off each arm as the men sat themselves at a booth. The men were ruder than the young boys who'd become regulars, and I'd never seen them in the bar before. They were also freshly shaved, their uniforms crisp and clean, haircuts neat. These were new to the war, likely from Russia itself. One of the officers took offense at one of Elena's servers, threatened to shoot her if she didn't deliver the drinks faster. It was a drunken threat, and the table laughed at the deadly joke. I changed my seat so as to be closer to the officers feigning drunkenness alongside the Russian soldiers as I sipped the non-alcoholic beer Elena kept especially for me. It was hard to hear their conversation over the din of the small, tightly packed bar, but I managed to glean enough information to confirm my suspicions. These were new arrivals, which meant their unit had been pulled from regular duty for the war. Putin had promised this war would remain a limited special military operation, but if he was pulling regular army units from their normal garrisons to enter the war, things couldn't be going so well. I needed more info to pass along to Joe, though. I prodded one of the soldiers, raising my cup high in the air. Hey you, make a toast to your unit, to victory. The drunken soldier thought it was a grand idea and quickly stood, calling out for a toast. To the 99th Motorized Rifle Brigade. To Russia. The bar erupted in cheers, and another stood up. To the 131st. More cheers. One of the officers stood. You little boys couldn't win the war without help, so leave the fighting to the professionals. To the 110th. The rest of the soldiers jeered and threw friendly insults at the officer but returned the toast. I had no idea how Russian units were numbered, but later that night I texted the unit number to Joe along with my observations. The response was another thumbs up. It was a tiny act of resistance, but it was also intelligence. Knowing which units were deployed where would help the military estimate enemy strength and find weak points to attack. 4. Katerina brought me dinner every night. Her daughter and grandchildren had been killed in the fighting. We'd both become a surrogate family to each other. Her presence was comforting, even if she worried ceaselessly about my activities. She warned me the neighborhood had been talking about me and my chummy relationship with the Russians. She couldn't give up my cover, not only when it would endanger her, but the Russians had collaborators everywhere, and there's no telling where such news would end up. I'd have to continue with the risk of having one of my own put a knife in my back. The friendly scam with the Russians was paying off in dividends, and my conversations with Joe became much more lengthy. My importance as an asset was clearly on the rise, but I didn't care about that, I just wanted the Russians out or dead. I'll have to leave the neighborhood soon, grandmother. Katerina's brow furrowed. Don't talk nonsense. I mean it. I patted her hand reassuringly. But I'll be back. Our boys are almost here and they're gonna need some help, but I'll have to lay low afterwards. Katerina nodded silently. So it's true? The explosions? It's the army? I nodded back. Slava Ukraini. Glory to the heroes. She left shortly after that. The sound of an animal yelping outside drew my attention back to the window that I'd been looking out of. At night it's easier to count Russian patrols, they're the only vehicles allowed on the streets. I heard the yelp again, followed by a loud, raucous laughing. Two Russian soldiers down the street, clearly drunk. They'd run across a stray dog and kicked it while it slept. Before it could get away, the second soldier landed a kick that sent it fleeing. Something inside of me snapped. After all the horror, this was it the straw that broke the camel's back. The wind outside was chilly, but I couldn't see my breath fog up thanks to the fact that most of the streetlights were out. The city had been darker since the occupation, 
Damage to the electrical grid from the initial fighting had only been partly repaired. Many city services still weren't fully functional. This was good though, the dark made it easier to move around without being spotted. I wasn't very concerned with the Russian patrol. The city was too big and the Russians had left too few troops behind to truly garrison the place outside of their places their military directly occupied. It could be as much as half an hour between patrols, but there was always a risk. The Russians didn't seem to keep very tight schedules, likely because their unprofessional army was staffed with drunks and conscripts. The two men were extremely intoxicated, and I was grateful there was no one on the streets for them to run into. They still carried their rifles slung on their shoulders. I didn't have a plan. The only thought I'd given was to grab the rifle or grenade I secretly kept stashed under my mattress, but both would be too loud. Still not thinking clearly, I grabbed the large bayonet that attached to the tip of my old Soviet rifle instead. It was one of the thousands of weapons freely distributed by the Ukrainian government at the start of the war. Now I walked quickly, but silently toward the two men from behind. They were so drunk and caught up in their own revelry that they never saw me coming. The 10-inch knife was up my right jacket sleeve, kept concealed for now. I wasn't a killer. I wasn't sure what to do, but I had been a hunter before the war. I knew the best way to kill swiftly was to sever the spine of an animal below the neck. I knew I'd killed before, but always indirectly. It was my information that killed people. That new American weapon must have killed dozens, maybe more. But I hadn't pulled the trigger myself, just told the ones who did when and where to hit. The knife dropped into my hand. I was only feet away. The soldier on the right looked more sober than his friend. I rushed toward him. Suddenly, his more drunken compatriot stumbled and fell on the sidewalk, half dragging his friend down. They both began to laugh, but the drunken friend turned to look behind them and spotted me. He snorted in derision upon seeing me, unaware of the danger. Kol Kol. His friend snickered and turned drunkenly to look behind him. My knife found him first. I practically crashed into him as I rushed forward in my excitement. The blade plunged into the back of his neck, severing the spine from the brain. His eyes rolled up into the back of his head as he let out a low gurgling noise and collapsed to the floor, dragging me down with him. His hot blood splashed on my face and jacket steaming in the air. You! Hey! Hey someone! Hey! The Russian already on the ground began to yell for help, reaching for his rifle and struggling to unsling it and bring it to bear. I struggled to extricate myself from the dying man's clutches and turned to his still living counterpart. I slapped the rifle away as he swung it around, but he still managed to pull the trigger. I lashed out with the knife, blindly, wildly stabbing. The rifle barked out a few more times and then finally it and the second soldier went silent. I stood for a moment, panting, struggling to catch my breath. Hot tears streamed down my eyes. Then I ran. I hurled the knife away down an alley as I passed it and ran as hard as I could stripping my jacket off and hiding it behind a dumpster. But my pants were covered in blood, and so was my face. I ran harder. There were people in windows looking cautiously about. The sound of gunfire wasn't unheard of in the Russian occupation, and few people were curious enough to risk their lives for anything more than a quick glance. I took a circuitous route back to my apartment. Once inside, I turned the sink on full blast and scrubbed myself clean. Even after I was already clean, I kept scrubbing for a long time. 5. The apartment smelled of stale cigarette smoke. I chain smoked nearly two packs over the course of one day after last night's incidents. The only thing that stopped me was the fact that I needed cigarettes to continue my relationship with the Russian patrols. Yaroslav stretched his long, lanky body out on my beaten couch. In a past life, I would have been angry at him laying out like that on my couch with his street clothes on, but those types of things just didn't matter anymore. Archer sat nervously fidgeting on a chair across from Yaroslav. The two were a true odd couple. Yaroslav was tall, lanky, had been a long-distance runner when he'd been in his teenage years. Now he worked as a taxi driver. It was a perfect job for gathering intelligence during a time where the Russians questioned anyone who hung around where they didn't seem to belong. Taxi driver slipped under the radar. Arthur was a baker standing only 5 foot 5. He was an unassuming man. Despite being in his mid-30s, he still had the face of youth. He was the type of person you didn't pay much attention to. Typical mousy baker who just wanted to live his own life and leave others free to live their own. Until the Russians arrived. When they'd first gotten here, a patrol of men had taken his sister. He'd never seen her again. Russians took another girl. At least this one they brought back three days later. Yaroslav folded his hands behind his head as he spoke, looking up at the ceiling. His face was impassive. It always was. It's what made him such a good spy. Where? Arthur's own voice quaked with emotion. Wealthy neighborhood. I take people from there to the markets and back again on occasion. A lot of them just mind their own business. Russia, Ukraine, long as you leave them alone, they don't care who's in charge. I bet now they care. What? What happened? Arthur still hadn't regained control of his emotions. This was hitting an obviously sore spot for the timid baker. 
two of their patrols rolled up. Normally, they leave those people alone. Who's going to start trouble in a neighborhood like that? Maybe the stupid Mobix didn't know where they were. Picked her up from right on the street, dumped her off a few days later like nothing happened. I could practically hear Arthur's teeth grinding. My own blood was running cold. I could remember the way it felt to plunge my knife into the Moscow's neck. It's the same guys always on patrol there. They like to park at the entrance of the neighborhood in their vehicles to laugh and smoke. Probably see it as easy duty. Let's, let's kill them. Arthur's voice was cold. Colder than I'd ever heard the small baker to be. He turned to me. You, you killed two last night. Let's do it. Let's kill more. It's time. The room hung in silence for long moments. Until last night, none of us had ever actually killed a single Russian. It was always someone else doing the killing. We knew our information was leading to death, but outside of hypotheticals, had never considered we'd be doing the killing ourselves. Arthur, listen to yourself. Russians are already up in arms over last night. You're lucky nobody was around to rat you out. The last part was aimed at me. Yaroslav was now sitting upright, chastising Arthur. No, Arthur's right. It's time we were more proactive. Now it was both Yaroslav and Arthur's turn to look stunned. What? What? Are you serious? Yaroslav spoke for both of them, but I could tell Arthur was intrigued. You hear the bombs and the explosions growing closer every day? The army's right out there. They need our help now. It's our turn to start doing more than just watching and reporting. Any day the fighting will be right here in our streets, and then what? The Russians are already buzzing around like bees because of last night, are you crazy? Arthur cleared his throat. <sighs> here, they are buzzing around here, but rich people? Never done anything to make them worry. I bet you those stupid Mobics are lounging around smoking their cigarettes as usual. Easy duty. Not a care in the world. Yaroslav didn't have an immediate answer. When he looked like he was about to speak, I stopped him. Arthur's right. Besides, best thing we could do to draw attention from here is to hit them there. Yaroslav's mouth opened and closed, like a fish gasping for air, as he thought up and then discarded arguments to voice. Finally, he gave up. Okay, how? I went to my bedroom and returned a few moments later, tossing a grenade into Yaroslav's lap and brandishing the rifle. I have one. Arthur as well. I know you have a few grenades you squirreled away after those special forces guys left the stash of weapons behind. Yaroslav nervously handled the grenade. Never actually used one. It's easy. You pull the pin and throw. Arthur mimed the actions. He was on board. Now we just needed Yaroslav because his taxi would be the key to the plan. After a while, my lanky friend sighed. Okay, let's do it. We waited another day for things to calm slightly. The Russians had sent several patrols into the neighborhood to talk to people. Anyone they didn't like the look of, they dragged away for questioning. I knew that meant beatings or worse, and I felt a tinge of guilt as I watched several people get thrown into Russian vehicles. I felt even worse when I was watching it happen as I chummed up with several of the Russian soldiers, regulars at Elena's bar, and accustomed to the friendly Ukrainian that always had cigarettes to share. I couldn't stay in this neighborhood much longer. For sure, by now, someone had fingered me as a collaborator. There was probably another partisan cell planning my demise, but I had just a little bit more work to do before taking off. The army really was close, the city would be contested again soon, and I was going to do my part. Three days after I murdered the two drunk Russians, I was cooped up in the trunk of Yaroslav's taxi lying next to Arthur. I was glad the baker was small, because while roomier than most, Yaroslav's trunk was still a tight fit, especially with the two rifles Arthur and I clutched. The plan was simple, inspired by American gangster movies. I wasn't a soldier, but the plan seemed good to me. Yaroslav shouted back at us, warning that we were approaching the target. If the Russians were there, he'd stop the vehicle and start a friendly chat. The moment he hit the trunk latch release, that was our cue. If the Russians weren't there or Yaroslav chickened out, the car would just keep on going. In the darkness of the trunk, I felt the car slowing, then come to a stop. But immediately after, the car rolled forward a bit and came to a slow stop again. I could tell Yaroslav was nervous from the way he sounded as he rolled the window down and greeted the Russians. I couldn't see anything, though. I could only blindly trust my friend had carefully followed the plan. Hey, vodka, you like? I have for sale. Yaroslav's Russian was not great, but enough to get the Mobik's attention. I could hear them laughing at their own jokes. It sounded distant, which was good. I'd instructed him to park across the street from them so our grenades wouldn't kill us. The Russian called back, and there was a small cheer. I could hear the Russian's voice growing closer. Okay, friend, show me. What you want, a trade? And there was a click as the trunk's latch popped. I pushed the trunk open, blinking against the sudden sunlight. The Russian, now standing at Yaroslav's window, looked in surprise, missing the pistol Yaroslav now pressed directly against his chest before squeezing the trigger four times. Arthur stumbled, throwing himself out of the trunk. I took a knee, remaining in the trunk itself, and leveled my Kalashnikov at the Russians. It was an old weapon, probably from the early Cold War, but when I pulled the trigger, it barked out a barrage of automatic gunfire. The Russians were screaming. One was cut down immediately, 
Another had time to reach for his own rifle before I left a stitch of bullets across his chest. The fake body armor he wore did nothing to stop the 7.62mm rounds. Archer's rifle rang out, but his shots were wild. I'm not sure he managed to hit anything but the two parked vehicles. I swapped fire to semi-automatic now for accuracy. Four Russians already lying dead on the cold concrete. Take this, you fuckers! Yaroslav hurled two of the grenades at the vehicles, and I immediately ducked back into the trunk as the twin explosions pelted the area with shrapnel. I could hear it bouncing off Yaroslav's taxi, and Arthur screamed out a curse. The Russians were dead. Well, all but one. He crawled out from behind one of the vehicles, leaving a long, bloody streak behind him. Shrapnel from the grenades must have gotten him. He moaned for help pitifully. Let's go, Arthur, in the car! I helped pick Arthur up and threw him back into the backseat of the taxi. What about him? Yaroslav pointed out the wounded Russian out his window. Leave him, he'll die on his own. My voice was ice cold as I slammed the car door shut, and Yaroslav punched the accelerator. 6. There wasn't much time anymore. The latest attack would have the Russians in a fury. I had to move fast. Yaroslav took the wounded Arthur to a friendly medic on the other side of town. His taxi had been peppered by shrapnel, and he was furious. There was no way he could drive that taxi around anymore. I felt bad for my friend, but decided he wouldn't have to worry about such things if the city was liberated soon. The fighting had indeed drawn near. Despite Russian propaganda, there was no denying it. The Ukrainian army was coming. That's why I had to act fast before the Russians fully mobilized to defend the city and before word of the latest attack put them all on guard. I rushed to Elena's bar, entering through the back door. I caught her eye as she happily served a group of Russians, one giving her a firm pat on her ample rump with a stupid grin on his face. She played the perfect host, though, and jokingly slapped his hand away. Picking up a tray of dirty cups, she walked through the double doors and into the kitchen. It's time. She eyed me up and down. Could probably still see the stress from the adrenaline overload from earlier still on my face. Then she simply nodded. Okay. Elena pointed to a wooden box in the corner of the rear storage area of the bar. Inside were chains she normally used to lock the place up at night, along with a hefty padlock. I grabbed those as she got to work on the various kegs in the room, punching out the spigots and letting the booze flow onto the floor. She smashed bottles of alcohol in their boxes with a hammer, making a proper mess of things. When she was done, there was half an inch of alcohol on the floor from various kegs and hundreds of shattered bottles. Satisfied with her work, she went back to the bar out front and ushered her two waitresses into the back. They looked at the storage room with wide eyes, but Elena pushed them along. We exited out the back door, closing it behind us. I wrapped the chains around the handles, padlocking them in place. Those two pig officers are in there tonight. I'm glad. Hey, you two girls, you go home. Stay home, understand? Elena's charm offensive was off. She was now all business. The two girls nodded nervously and took off. They didn't need to be told twice. Side window? Elena nodded to my question and we both made our way around to the side of the small bar. It was built out of an old half basement, so it was sunken into the ground about five feet. On the side, a small window had been propped open, out of which came the strong stink of mixed alcohols. Elena squatted down and reached for a lighter and some scrap paper she'd salvaged from inside. Fucking Russians. I love that bar. I grasped her shoulder once to comfort her. I could see the pain on her face. This wasn't just about the bar or what we were about to do or had already done. It was about everything. None of us wanted this. We just wanted to live our lives. Her face became hard once more. She tossed the lit papers in. There was an immediate swooshing sound from inside. We moved quickly to the front. The main door was down a small flight of steps. I hurried down them to chain and padlock the entrance. As the padlock clicked into place, I could still hear the Russians laughing and partying inside. They hadn't noticed the girl's absence just yet. Did the two officers bring the prostitutes with them? Elena shook her head. No, not this time. Despite myself, I breathed a sigh of relief. We hurried up the stairs and out to the street. As we began to cross it, we could hear the chains rattle, then rattle even harder as the panicked pushes into the door grew in intensity. The chains were thick, they'd hold. The only windows in that bar were in the rear, which was now a raging inferno. Joe had explained it to me like this. The Russians didn't fight very good with orders. You could kill a bunch of dumb mobics and that was good for the war, but what was better was killing the officers. The more senior, the better. 7. Someone had spotted me. At the bar, maybe even at the rich neighborhood, someone somewhere had made me. I knew the moment I heard the sound of many feet aggressively stomping up the stairs outside of my apartment. I'd come back home to pack up what few belongings I had. Katarina had insisted on making me dinner. She was practically weeping. She begged me to stay and eat. I told her this was just a temporary goodbye, but with the war about to break over us once more, both of us knew the odds. She'd made borscht tonight. She'd obviously been saving up for it. One last special dinner. The angry stomps turned into angry banging at my door. A Russian FSB officer identified himself, warned me I was under arrest and to open the door. They had a squad outside the building ready to shoot 
so don't even try anything stupid out the window. I ignored him as I fished around my mattress for something. My apartment was a small one bedroom place, wasn't much, but I'd been proud of earning enough to have my own place. My mother didn't like it, my desire for independence was too American, she said. I was supposed to stay home until I found a nice girl and got married, that was tradition. I knew she was just having trouble letting me go. I should have stayed home. Then I would have been with all of them when the Russian bomb hit the apartment building, turning half of it into rubble. Never even got to bury their remains. Hundreds of tons of concrete had collapsed together into one massive heap. The area was marked for later cleanup and remains retrieval by the city. There just wasn't enough functioning city services to see to it now. I walked out of my bedroom door and leaned against the frame. It faced directly at the front door, which was beginning to buckle under the pressure of multiple blows. Sledgehammers, by the sound of things. I couldn't let them take me. I'd heard what they did to the other prisoners in the various detention centers that had sprung up around the city. It could be weeks before they even charged you with anything, and by then, they would have tortured you dozens of times. Even innocent people made up names for the Russians in a desperate attempt to save themselves. These people, also innocent, got dragged into makeshift torture centers, inevitably giving more names. Sometimes the names were even right. This was how Russia conducted counterinsurgency. I didn't know how brave I was. I was brave enough to shoot at Russians, sure, but was I brave enough to keep my mouth shut under torture? I didn't know. I thought about Katerina, Arthur, Elena, and Yaroslav. The door suddenly buckled under the force of the blows, the top half breaking into splinters. More angry shouts demanding I get down on the ground. I could see the faces of various Russians as they angrily kicked at the bottom of the stubborn door. I ignored them and simply watched from a few feet away. Finally, the door gave way. First guy through was dressed in civilian clothing, brandishing a pistol. This must have been the FSB guy. Russian security services. The master torturers. While the military was inventive, the FSB had torture down to a science. The man demanded I get down as he rushed toward me. Behind my back, I removed the pin from the grenade, then slowly brought my hands around. The FSB agent spotted the grenade as it came around my body, his eyes going wide. Slava Ukraini. The agent fired, bullets smashing into my chest. A moments later, the world went bright and loud. Now go check out Surviving Actual Military Combat, a true story, or click this other video instead.